Thank you so, so much, Uka. I read this essay last year and I recommended it to my uh, mentees in the Spring Writing Fellowship and on other places too. I always recommend this and um, another powerful uh, feminine um, essays that I've read for my mentees. Thank you very much. It was beautiful. And thank you everyone for joining once again. For those who are in the live audiences, for those who are here presently, thank you very much. We're going to speed up things with uh, each speaker taking just five minutes, exactly five minutes, so we don't have to be logged out again. Um, the next speaker would be Hene Kere Kwaku from Ghana. Hene, are you here? Yeah. Hene Kere Kwaku, are you here? Hi. Okay, great. You good have to morning, stay. good afternoon. Thank you, um, everyone. I, I'm really, really <clears throat> happy to be here this morning. It's actually 5.32 a.m. at my end, um, and I nearly missed the time. Okay. I'm going to read a few poems, and the first poem I'm reading is Oubafo, for Kwekubo Sonche and Api Anthony. In pretending absence, you left your bed to make dreams between the sweeps of a broom, the biggest on the compound. Even if your child does not say to him, my father says he's not around, he will find you the stranger. That rainy season, he climbed down like the hamatan. We woke one morning and could not tell our faces from the trees. It was as if God was setting fire and the smoke was an invitation to early risers to fetch some embers. But a stranger, it was him. He had come over with a cloak over where a head should be, taking the biggest broom on the compound and you along with it. The next poem I'm reading is In Praise of Mary Anna Seri. February and Hamatan reappears, whitening your knuckles. For the third time this day, you sweep the compound. Dawn before your thoughts are mixed with that of the kindergartners. Afternoon when you return to make supper. In wait of a husband, a beloved father, almost the last to be home from work. You know, I say this again. Let the neem's leaves yellow the compound. For once, be oblivious to those who are oblivious to your prayers that keep your children alive and eaten. You sweet country of mine, the world is a beard, fire lumen, where is your water? And the last poem I'm going to read this morning is reading an obit to your absence after a walk through intimacy by Terry's Ankuma. Under the auspices of the wind, light revealed in the dark places of the world, the cranium of an animal, once loved, now grieved. The grave of a woman who died too green to breastfeed a baby. The bees make a home. When the curtains swell to the wind, a humorous arises in the alchemy of blood. Anansi, Kweku, when you, wore, when you wove capillaries through this body, was it a blueprint for a dating app or you were making quilts for the cold? If you made a home with a weaver bed, it would hold water, but the strength of a home is in its porosity. Under the auspices of the wind is the light concealed. Where you once laid, now a dark place, I make my home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry Kwaku, uh, for that beautiful rendition. We appreciate your being here. Um, thank you. For the final reader, who would be uh, Rotendo Chizozo. From Zimbabwe. Thank you very much, Rotendo. You, I think you're muted. I think you're muted. Hello, can we hear me? Yeah, I can. we can hear you, but we can't hear her. Right. Okay, okay. 
Uh, Rotando, I think it's your network. I don't know. Um, could you try again? Could, could be the headset. Okay. If you can hear me, Rotando, could you use it without? Could you try without a headset for a moment? Could you unplug your headset for a moment? Um, can you hear me now? Oh, great, great. Just one minute before before you uh, read. Um, to everyone else in the audience who's, who's listening to the readings and the keynote speech, uh, feel free to compile your questions. We would have about 10 minutes, about 10 minutes or 15 at most after this, after uh, return those readings to ask questions to the 18 uh, readers. So please get those ready. We we'll have 15 minutes for that. Yes, please. Um, return those, you have the stage. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I am reading from a short story called God Resides Inside the Walmart. And I'm staying a little bit in the middle of the story. So at this point, our narrator has seen an old lady in a Walmart and nobody has been helping her. She's been asking for help. Hi, can I help you? You ask slowly. The old woman looks at you, like really looks at you. Her eyes study you and you regret coming over. You are never good at minding your own business. Are you? Her wrinkled finger points at you. Like me? With the same? She asked in broken English. You're not sure what she means by that, so you shake your head. You, you like me, she insists, and you shake your head again. The old woman, frustrated, pulls out a necklace from underneath her t-shirt and points at the Africa pendant. You're from here. You notice that she tells you you're from Africa. You almost nod, but then you think twice. Are you? You hadn't been back home in your home country in almost 30 years. You barely spoke your language. You considered yourself American now not African-American, because your father refused to be associated with them. No matter how much you told him, Baba, black is black in America. Bullets can't tell if you're African or not. In the end, you shake your head, and the old woman shakes her head too. Albeit a head shake carries a bit of disappointment. You don't know why you feel ashamed for her disapproval. It's like back when you were a child and you've done something bad. Instead of your mom hitting you with a stick, she would say she was disappointed in you. And somehow, that is worse than a beating. The old woman brings out the little girl from behind her and says something in a language you still don't understand. You hear the clicks again, and from her necklace, you're 100% sure she's African. Maybe she's South African. You remember they spoke Zulu there. The little girl nods, and she, the little girl nods shyly and looks at you. Um, my grandmother is asking if you're from Zimbabwe. She says quietly in fluent English. Her accent is thick, and you recognize it. You used to have it. Now it only exists in home videos shot on an old Sony camera. I moved from Zimbabwe to the Rapids a long, long time ago, you say. So I guess I used to be from Zim. I'm from here now. I live in New York City. The little girl translates to her grandmother. To your surprise, the old woman ululates and dances in a circle inside a Walmart. You feel embarrassed because everyone is looking at you. And even though you look nothing alike to white people, you all look the same. So by association, everyone thinks and everyone in the L thinks your family. You want to distance yourself from them, but then you notice the little girl doing the same thing. Your shame doubles because why are you feeling embarrassed as a grown woman? Gogo, stop. Mama said not to do that anymore. The little girl whispers. Gogo doesn't listen. Instead, she cups her hands and cups in front of you, then raises her hands towards the ceiling, wheels one more time, and says it in English. God resides inside the Walmart. God is good. The old woman speaks to you in another foreign language. This time you understand her because your parents used to speak to you in Shauna until they stopped when your second grade teacher told them you couldn't read or write in English. And if your parents didn't find your tutor soon, you'd be held back. You're already a grade behind your age mates. Your parents didn't know English then, so they'll record conversations and play them for your auntie who would translate for them. Your auntie enrolled you in English second language classes after school, and as you learned to repress your tongue, you taught your parents in return. Even though you understand what the old woman is saying, you don't know how to reply in Shauna, so you turn to the girl. Can you tell her I don't speak Shauna? You feel bad for her, this little girl who used to be like you. With the way they are dressed, you're almost positive they recently immigrated to the States. Your mom, your mom used to walk out of the house in her Zambia and Patapadas and Dukes. She used to go to the grocery stores wearing clothes she'd wear well back in Zim. Confused by the American Isles, mesmerized by the amount of food in stock, disgusted by the cats and dogs allowed in stores. Annoyed, she couldn't find some food anywhere. Then as you grew older, attended very white liberal schools, thanks to your auntie's zip code and connections, you began to feel ashamed to have your mother come pick you up in the Zambias and Patapatas and Dukes. So you asked her to wait for you at the bus stop. 
He also asked her to stop picking sad and matemba or madora and chumalia, and instead asked her to make you ham and cheese sandwiches or kale salads. You hated the taste of, of you hated the blunt taste of ham and cheese, and kale tasted worse than dog shit. Or you are so tired of your classmates always asking you why you ate weird food. One night you overheard your mother complain to your father that Maita was changing and she didn't like it. At first, you didn't know she was talking about you because you no longer went by Maita. Everyone called you May. Your father, tired from a long day of work, grumbled something incoherent and minutes later, snores pulled the basement room you shared with your parents. Your mother prayed all night that night, begging America to not swallow her child. And I think I will, I will end there. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Rotendo. Uh, by the way, this story is uh, it's available on the Shallow Tales Review website, and uh, it won the best short story. This in this year's um, reading a uh, best of a shallow year award for the Shallow Tales Review. So that's a great one. All right, so we have fifteen minutes. So let's take ten minutes to ask questions. Um, so we have uh, let's have some people ask their questions to the uh, readers. Uh, we just want three questions in 10 minutes so we could round off neatly. Um, but we'll do that. I need to put out an apology that this is, um, uh, we're really sorry for the mild glitches. We didn't plan for this. We usually have a full stretch, but I don't know what happened. This uh, happened and we just have to make do with what we have, but it's not happened before and we don't. we hope it won't happen again. And uh, we also want to inform you all that the meeting has been recorded and clips of it um, will be broadcast um, in the coming days. Okay, so let's have three questions. And um, yes, from anyone, you could type your questions in the comment section or you could just um, say it out. So we, we hope to end this section in 10 minutes. So let's ask our questions to the keynote speaker to and to all the other, other readers. By the way, some people dropped some questions in, in the database. We have some questions. Uh, Bash had one question. Jun also has one, which we communicated to you. Bash, are you there? Yeah, I am. OK, great. Jun um, um, also has a question. You, I think you have the question think, there. Do you have the question? Hello? Do you have the question? Okay, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna search for it. Um, yeah, this helped me out. I remember I okay. it somewhere. Great, fantastic. So we could just use those ones mm. since we don't have any live questions. Um, okay, I think um, the the person asked you. Yeah. They say that looking at the agonizing hardship in the country yes. in Nigeria, yes. Yes. they specified how can we navigate without losing our creative passion. Um, Going by the very um, hard realities in Nigeria, how do we navigate right without losing passion for it? All right, can I go on? So, um, yeah, when you go back to uh, the history of creative writing in Nigeria, you would find out that um, most of the best writings, the most classic writings we have, the ones we consider as, consider as the the bedrock of, of our literary uh, creative essence as Africans, were actually works that were churned out at the hardest times. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they were churned out during the colonial era, during the apartheid era, and, and all of that. Uh, you, I mean, if you look at Christopher Kivu's uh, materials, they were they were materials that essentially uh, were born out of the whole civil um, <laughs> civil war uh, challenge and all of that. So, it, 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 you you cannot disqualify the capability of the human mind to want to express its highest emotional. Um, 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 what's the word now? It's this highest emotional essence at the point where there is very high emotion. So it's more of uh, this is actually.